Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled The Spring Bonito Run, and it's going to be featuring Captain Zane Long of Falling Tide Fishing Adventures out of the Wrightsville Beach area. And we're going to cover such areas of trolling around structure, casting and jigging around structure, trolling around bait in the open water, and then ultimately casting to busting fish. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing news, uh, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and here in our latest and greatest effort, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series, where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights on how to catch more fish more often. And making this possible is my partner, my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Hey, Billy, hey, let's talk about some Benito. Hey, what's going on, Gary? Good to see you, man. Always excited to talk about Benito. It's one of my favorite types of fishing when I get to do it. So much fun, run and gun and catch some fish. So I'm pretty excited to to get to get the pump prime for Benito season, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be a good episode. Always gets Yeah, excited. man. I think a lot I think it's a lot of people's favorite. I think a lot of people would like a little bit more confidence that when they head out the inlet, you know, they have a reasonable good chance of putting some of those tasty fish, hard fighting tasty fish in the boat. And I think Zane is yeah. here to help in that in that endeavor. Yeah, man, they are pretty hard fighting, so I'm excited to, to hear how he does it. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but before we get going here, Gary, just want to be sure to shout out to our sponsors and give them a big thank you for making this show possible. First up, we got Bland Landscaping Company. Uh, they've been around for a really long time, as you can see, and they are looking for people to join their team who are passionate about the outdoors, who want to get up early, go to work, get off early, get on the water, spend time with friends and family. So we really appreciate Bland. Uh, and those guys for reaching out to us and they love the show. So they're fans of the show. So hello to everyone over there. Thanks for sponsoring the show and get a new career this year. There you go. Go sign up at their website. And we love anyone that loves the show. It's really that simple a recipe. Yeah. If you like us, we tend to like you back. That's right. That's right, Gary. And in us liking you is everything in the world. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> it's like I was talking to Joe Rogan about the other day. Uh, yeah, that interview hasn't. Gary, you weren't supposed to say anything. We're not. It's not been released anyway. <laughs> all right, enough of our imaginations running wild. Uh, speaking of people that we really like, and I think that really like us is Marine Warehouse Center. I got a quick message from those guys, and we'll be right back. Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Boom, there you go, Gary. Good it's dudes, time, man. man. Sales, time. service parts, being part of the fishing community, part of the boating community. Big fans of Marine Warehouse Center. I would I would venture to say we're fans of them, whether they like us back or not. We like them. We are like is that deep. Well, I know most of the people like me. I don't know if Terrell likes you for telling all his jokes on air, but you know whatever this is between you and him. Terrell you know, he, has nothing to do with this, by the way. He gave me one for this one. <laughs> I was wondering if I I was wondering if Terrell had already shared a version of this joke with me before. Um, maybe if we have close listeners, they'll let me know. But this is the joke he gave me. I mean, this is what he told me to say. Um, Terrell's joke, not mine. How do you turn a boat into a party boat? I have no idea. Peer pressure. Okay, that's pretty good. That one's pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny for me to like belly laugh over, but it's pretty clever. <laughs> well, there you go. Terrell will be happy. I mean, I don't think... He doesn't. He still has an old AOL disc for his email, so I don't know if he's watching the podcast. So someone's going to have to stop by and tell him that he did a good one in this episode. Yeah, I don't know who has worse internet, me or Terrell. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but we like them. We like those guys. We hope yeah. we are doing a good job of getting the word out. Marine Warehouse Center, open for business. Yep, and not just uh, locally in North Carolina area and also in South Carolina, Charleston area, but also worldwide, so they'll ship anywhere. So if you're listening, wherever, whatever country, uh, reach out to them if they have something you need and see if they got it and can ship it over to you. So it's another thing to remember. I always forget I about that. So. I agree. I, th- I forget about that too, man. I I tell you what, man, we should do some podcasts down in Charleston. What a great, what a, we need a reason to go down to Charleston. Love it down there. Yeah, that'd be awesome, man. Hey, uh, how about a fish photo, man? Like I, I am psyched Ooh. for the season ahead. Here's a little appetizer. If you're watching the show, we got Corey Tremult with a false albacore that struck a diamond jig. He was fishing offshore of Topsail Island. So, um, I get, is that, that's a good looking fish. That's a good looking fish. Yeah, man, hard fighting, but that is the Benita with an A, not the Benito with an O. So that would not be an appetizer. Oh, that would not. Oh. Although someone's going to text in and say, "I know how to cook false albacore," <laughs> and then we'll just politely them. ignore them. But go ahead and do it anyway, everyone. Please, we want to <laughs> hear your recipe for Benita. But Benito is the name of the game tonight with Captain Zane Long. Looking forward to it. Yeah, just go tell Terrell your your Benita um, recipe. He's really interested. <laughs> yeah, stop by Marine <laughs> Warehouse Center, please. And uh, before I remind you of Billy's best takeaway, once again, a plug, man. We are out. We are out with weekly fishing reports. This is the new venture of Fisherman's Post, a new venture of Billy and I. And if you are inshore minded, because we couldn't do the whole gamut, we couldn't do offshore, near shore, surf and pier. But if you're inshore minded, then do we have a treat for you in 2022? Uh, inshore fishing reports, premium reports behind a paid wall. Just check out fishermanspost.com. Click on premium content for more information. And that's my quick plug before we get to Zane Long. How to do, Billy? Sounds good, man. Don't, don't miss out. Now's the time for sure. Don't miss that cheaper charter membership price that's for sure so all right well yeah charter membership special and i think at the airing of this that that uh special is still in effect so act now you're basically saving 50 percent. billy thorpe here <laughs> <You've> been... <laughs> oh, God. I'll leave. okay i'm gonna get ready for my best takeaway <laughs> billy's best benito takeaway billy's best benito Takeaway, but right now, my pleasure, Captain Zane Long, Falling Tide Fishing Adventures out of the Wrightsville Beach area, here to talk about the Spring Bonita Run. Zane, thank you for making time to talk with me, to talk with our audience about this very popular spring fishery. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing good, man. How are you? Man, we're doing good. Again, excited for the season. Happy to have you here. And you have been a guest, albeit a partner guest, when we did first strike. So this is your first solo appearance. But I think you still know the routine. We got two questions for you before we get to the main event. Are you ready for question number one, Captain Zane Long? I'm as ready as I'll be, I guess. Well, the first one, pretty standard, predictable. Why should anyone listen to what Captain Zane Long has to say about a Benito? Well, um, Gary, I guess it's... uh something i'm really passionate about man it's like a breath of fresh air for guiding uh full time around here you fish winter the whole you know winter reds and and near shore sheep's head and stuff all winter and it's uh something that it's exciting for me i look forward to it every year as does everyone else um i've been doing it for years i i i think i'm pretty good at it um it's uh just something that i get excited for and i know in most cases when the captain's excited, um, it's, it's a good thing. So, um, yeah, man, I just, I just love it. I feel like everyone does. And it's something that I try to dive a little deeper in and, and figure it out a little better every year. And I think I just like anything, if you work hard at it, you do get better at it. So I, I feel like over the years I've gotten better at, at maybe getting those finicky fish to bite or, or finding them when they're not, when they're hard to be found. And, and, uh, yeah, I guess, that's all about that. And that's a solid answer. That's as solid as an answer as we get to that question. All right. For question number two, typically a non-fishing related question. I, I think I've done this before as well. Benito, ending with an O, the good tasty one. Benita, ending with an A, the not so tasty one. So that one letter changes the whole word. It changes the whole scope of what we're talking about. So your intellectual challenge 
Zane Long is, I'm going to give you a word. You got to change one letter and make it a new word. Are you ready for this intellectual challenge? <laughs> Probably not, man, but go ahead. I bet you'll do okay. All right. Sl slap. Um, change the P into a W, man. Reading slow. You're <laughs> perfect. What a great answer. You only got two more. <laughs> Soak. Oh God, there's more. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, soak. Soak was the. What did I say? You said soak. Okay, so <laughs> we're change it to to a P, man. <laughs> yes, you're good. And then the last one, and then I'll back off and let you talk about something you're more comfortable talking about. <laughs> Bark. Bark. Um. All right. We'll change the B to a P, and we're going for a walk, man. You got it, man. You're great at this. I knew you would rise to the intellectual challenge. All right. So here we are. Now we're talking about Benito. And so the person's on their boat. They're heading out the inlet. They're excited. They got all their, you know, they believe they're prepped for the day. And again, ideal situation. Sure. We come out the inlet, we see busting fish and it's as simple as that, but by no means is it always even often as simple as that. So often the day involves heading to a plan, heading to some structure and then seeing what arises either on the journey there, the journey back, or while you're out there. So I like in your notes, starting with trolling around structure. So let's put that into play. We, we're headed out the inlet. And I guess just in general, before we even talk about a, you know trolling around structure, what structures are the most attractive to you? I'm not saying you have to name names, but like where in what zone do you would you suggest people look you know zero to x amount of miles structure with live bottom or actual wrecks like what is it that you think produce most often sure that's a good question so um you know the generally speaking the bonito will stick to the higher structures during the day um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the highest structure um you know, around, you know, it could be the highest structure in the, in the, in the zone that they're in. Um, I try to target anywhere from, you know, a mile to five and sometimes, you know, seven or eight miles, depending on water temperature. Um, but let's say we start at, um, three miles. Uh, I'll, I'll, I like to at first check live bottom spots mostly because, uh, it won't be as crowded. And as we all know, the Benito does draw the crowd. Um, so live bottom, your small little ledges and, and Swiss cheese limestone can hold masses of those fish. Um, <clears throat> but your artificial reefs work just as well, if not sometimes better. Um, and generally speaking, if you're, if, if you're busting the inlet at daylight, those fish aren't going to be concentrated tight to that structure as you would find them later in the day. You know, they're going to be rising to the top with the bait fish. If they're not busting actively feeding on those bait fish on the top where you can visually see them, they most certainly are in the water column feeding. You know, that's what that they want to do um, right as the sun comes up, you get the first light, you get the sun popping up and those fish are going to be feeding. Um, a good way to start for me is if I'm going, to, if I'm planning to troll, um, which I do do some, not as much as casting, but there's definitely times where, where folks aren't comfortable casting. And if there's, you know, too many folks for me to cast for, um, I, I will pick the structure or whatever it may be that I'm going to plan to fish that day. And I'll stop short, man. I'll stop, um, you know sometimes a half a mile short of where I'm planning to go and I'll put lines out. And, and when I'm trolling for, for me personally, I'm using Yozuri's something like, like this. It's just a, and this one's had some use as you see. Um, but um, you can also troll with planers. Um, I will say if you're trolling early in the morning, a mistake that some folks will make is, They'll go out and put their number two planers out with their Clark spoons um, first thing in the morning. And you're just simply under those fish. Those fish are on top feeding on bait that has risen, risen in the water column. Um, and they're not going to be down deep where your 
Clark spoon is. So a good way to get around that is to use a light trolling weight, um, anywhere from like two ounce. So they make eight ounce trolling weights, uh, just depending on um, how fast you're going. Um, but I'll troll my way to that structure. And if I don't get a bite, I'll troll my way past that structure and I'll troll around and I'll, and I'll, you know, make almost a grid around and then, and then reassess the situation. Um, but more times than not, those fish aren't going to be on top of that, you know, wreck or ledge or, or limestone bottom. They're, they're going to be out attacking that bait fish, which can take them if the bait fish are, moving fast away you know they, they can take them you know almost a mile away from where they you know called home that day before or that night or or what have you so um a good thing to remember is is if if you're going to troll a structure you know you don't always have to start right on top of it because the fish probably aren't going to be there first thing in the morning all right so let me um let me see if i can unpack some of what you just said because that was a lot of information and i mean I'm, so we're off to a great start so in the morning in the low light conditions those fish, just like bait, are going to be more congregated in the top of the water column. So you want to, well, you want to dedicate your efforts more to the top of the water column and nothing really deep, while the low, while you're in low light conditions. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just they're they're not up there for no reason. You know, they're up there because the bait has has rose to the top of the water. So, um, you know, you, you, I'm not saying it will never happen. You know, put a put a Clark spoon down if you want. Um, you might, you might snag one. I mean, it's, uh, anything can happen out there, but I would definitely concentrate my efforts towards the top of the water column first thing in the morning. All right. And if we're trolling, so, you know, we're now, we're just in our search pattern to see something, you know, hoping to see something to get us excited about to cast or jig to, or you're, you're going to talk more about casting and jigging just around structure in general, sure. but, uh, are you having, and again, I, I just think of my crowd as being a little bit more you know, we like convenience. We like to keep it as simple as we can and still be productive. So if I'm out there in my center console and I'm really just want to troll two lines and I want to troll them well, that a deep diver and something else, or would you suggest two deep divers? Like what, what would be your suggestion for the casual boat guy who's out there with the center console and wants to give this a shot and just wants to do two lines better than messing up three lines? Sure. So yeah, I would recommend I would recommend one deep diver like this, and then a Clark spoon on a light trolling weight. And you know you don't have to put them on a trolling weight, but a lot of times if you if you go a little too fast, you'll end up um, that thing skipping across the top of the water. So I recommend like a three ounce or four ounce trolling weight. Um, you know, and anywhere from you know fifteen to twenty feet of leader behind that trolling weight. So the trolling weight would be in place of your planer which would allow it to be under the water surface but not push down 15 20 feet in the water column you know these deep divers will run about i think eight to ten feet um down when you're trolling them um and i would i would vary my speed anywhere from like four knots like seven knots sometimes and so on the deep diver again some more follow-up questions on the deep diver i mean if i go into the tackle shop man they've got any number of choices for me to choose from i i like the redhead white body that you held up how much does color matter like how many different color options do you have or are you prepared to throw out if you're feeling the fish are finicky sure so i think with the deep diver um maybe not so much color matters i don't know why but for bonito i always I always tend to lean to pink and I think it just goes back to years ago. The first time that I was very successful with jigs or anything really for the Bonito was I was throwing pink. So it's just like a comfort thing for me or, um, I guess, but I think more so than color would be flash. So like if you go in, you can't tell, well, maybe you can, but this one was just, just solid red and white. Um, they make those things in all shades in between where you can have it. It almost looks like like broken glass mirror lure type thing where it's very shiny. And I think you can have them, you know, they make them even like a solid dark color, like a solid red or a solid purple. Um, I think that can vary even throughout the day. You know, I, I think um, the flash is really good in l low light or overcast conditions. If I if if it's cloudy, if it's if it's first thing in the morning, um, 
have some flash, man. Reflect what light you have. Um, I think the super flashy mirror like appearance on a really sunny day um, cannot be so good. I think it, it, it can have, you know, an adverse effect on, on the fish. It can, it, it looks unnatural, you know, same with some Clark spoons will have, you know, be a shiny me metallic um, surface. And some of them are, you know, yellow or pink or, you know, the whole thing is a, uh, is a solid color. So I think more so than the color itself um, is, is the, um, the finish, you know, a solid finish or a metallic finish. And then, uh, Jumping over to the Clarkspin, you've already basically addressed color. But my other question with Clarkspin was size. Like, what is it that you tend to start with before you decide I need to go bigger or smaller? Man, I don't want to put out any information that. So I think with Clark spoons, you can go big, man. Bonito, Bonito aren't like false albacore where they can get super finicky on size. I mean, I mean, we were catching them last year. I was jigging like full size uh what do you call them like like butterfly jigs like free fall jigs that you would use on like amberjack or like african pompano we were catching them on like full size like five inch metal jigs so um they, they're they're toothy and they and they feed just like a mackerel will feed i mean I'm, i think they would prefer to eat something bite size but they will eat a full size pogey you know they, they have teeth just like a mackerel as as most of you know so I think, um, you know, vary the size and, 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 and if, if you, if you think you might be too going too big, then, then, then have a couple Spanish mackerel size, uh, Clark spoons. But I, a, a friend of mine who runs a larger center console, he guides off of, he, he trolls with them for dr with drone spoons. So something that you would be using specifically to target large King mackerel, he, he uses for the Benito. So. I think bigger is better in some cases for these fish. And when you're putting them out behind the boat, are you putting the Clark spoon and the deep diver side by side? I'm guessing you're staggering them at least a little bit, having one out further than the other. And any any direction on how far out you like to put them behind the boat? Um, yeah, man. So so the um, the deep divers, I, I like to let them back a little bit, man. I, I think you get a little better action. You don't get too much. Um, uh like if you if you don't have much line out with those deep divers i don't think they work right you'll have them sometimes where they'll tend to lean one way if, you, if they're if they're in your boat way um I, I like to get them out past my prop wash so um at least uh let's say um you know 30 yards um the 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 clark spoon as far as like them getting tangled you know a, a, a Clark spoon with a trolling weight is going to be relatively high in the water column. So you're, you can put that almost prop wash, if not a little further back, I would definitely put my deep diver back further than my, than my Clark spoon in both cases, whether the Clark spoon is going to be on a trolling weight and going to be above the deep diver, or if you're going to have a planer on and it's going to be below the deep diver. I, I think I like to keep my um, Clark spoon close. And then is there any pattern that you've noticed as far as like trolling with the waves, trolling against the waves? Do, does anyone seem to produce more often or any given day, anything can happen? Man, I think any given day, it, I, I think it really doesn't matter. Maybe on, if you're in some current, you know, um, out in front of Wrightsville Beach, the current is, is not really there. But if you get out um, on the other side of the shoals on, in the river mouth or out of Southport, you know, current can be a big factor. So I think not maybe so much with the waves, but with the current and against the current can matter. I think those fish will stack and face current sometimes. So sometimes trolling with the current can be more productive. Um, and I'm sure there'll be people that say differently that have experienced different things. But I think if I'm on um, in, in a high current situation or any current rather, I think trolling with the current gets more bites. But um, when you're trolling around structure, you know, you kind of have to um, make your adjustments in, in direction. So um, I think what is important to remember more so than what's going to get more bites, because you're going to be changing that constantly, is to look at your speed. If you have electronics um, that, that, that show how fast you're going, I think it's important to look at that because it can certainly vary. And when you're 
going with the current or um, into a um, falling sea or, or a head sea, you know, it changes certainly. So, um, you know, even like three to four knots sometimes. So that is a big difference in keeping the productivity up. If you're getting a bite at five knots um, into the current and you turn around and you're going with the current or with the swell and you're now going seven, you know, eight knots, um, that's a big difference, man. You might not be getting that bite. So it's important to keep an eye on your speed. Okay. So now I guess my question is we are trolling around the structure. And so what needs to happen before you either a decide it's not happening here and start looking for another location to target or B you start deciding, man, I'm pulling up the trolling gear. I'm going to try, I'm going to try jigging. Sure. So, um, you know, I'll troll for, man, I, I'm, I'm not the best for, for a time on trolling because I get um, sort of bored of it quick just because I, I like action, you know, um, if it's, if it's going off and the bite's going off, I'll troll all day. Um, but I would say, give it some time, but also, you know, trolling over the same area multiple times, you know, if you're not getting one or two bites every pass, or if you're not getting one or two bites every other pass, I would, I would look into making that, um, making that troll pattern different. So like maybe branch out instead of trolling, you know, let's say a quarter mile off the structure one way and a quarter mile the other way, maybe going a half mile out and just turning around at the structure and, and cl doing some clover leaves. I, I, I find that if, if, if those fish aren't holding tight to that structure, you know, going back and forth over it, it isn't going to really produce. So if you can maybe do a clover leaf out, a clover leaf out, a clover leaf out, branch off in a different direction. If you're, if you're, um, stuck to trolling, I, I would definitely change areas. You know, normally those fish are not going to be too crazy finicky. If they are in the water column, if they are feeding, they're going to be, <clears throat> they're going to be willing to eat just about anything you're pulling. So I would say go into different areas, even if it's in the same area, you know, go, go a half mile out, go a half mile inshore, you know, see if you can find where they're at. And if that doesn't work, then yeah, sure. You can, you can start jigging. And so are you like looking to see marks on the machine before you start jigging? Are you waiting just to see what bites you get before you start jigging? I mean, I know you're, I fish with you. I know you like action. I know you don't want to, you know, troll for too long, but what happens that gives you confidence in jigging, not just deciding to jig because you're a little tired of trolling. Sure. So um, with the Bonito, man, it's actually uh, pretty crazy how um, the angle of the bait for some reason really matters. So I have trolled over an area, um, you know, for 20 minutes or so and not even wasn't able to buy a bite. Stop, you know, knowing I'm marking fish, I'm marking fish on my screen or I'm in an area that I know is holding them because they were there the day before which I guess doesn't always mean they're holding, but it gives me a good shot at it. Um, I've trolled over that area, pulled back, put the trolling motor in and started jigging and caught a fish every drop. And, it, and it's, it's, it's something about that, that bait is getting away where if you're, if you're coming with a deep diver or Clark spoon or whatever that they're able to look at that bait and in the same depth of water, at the same speed constantly and it doesn't trigger that like i'm not going to be able to get it that you know works for redfish largemouth bass and bonito i mean it just about every predatory fish has a has an instinctual fear of that bait that they see changing direction and getting away and they want to get it so dropping that jig down and pulling it up towards the boat or what i call yo-yoing a jig um or casting it letting it sink and burning it in it's it's in their zone where they're at and it's leaving it's coming up towards the, where you're reeling it into and it can really trigger a, a bite man and, and i've definitely been sitting out there at, at wherever i'm at and there's people trolling all around me and i'm sitting with you know a, a, a small metal jig just catching them as fast as i can so what is it that you like to jig what is it that you like to drop so I take, um, I, you know, there's 
a bunch of people make them. Um, this is just ones that I order on the internet. Um, it's a uh, just a, this this one is a uh, three quarter ounce um, jig. You you know ounce ounce and a half work fine as well depending on what you're doing. I like the three quarter to an ounce just so I can use lighter tackle when I'm when I'm throwing them. Um, if you notice, I I almost always on my metal jigs take the um, take the treble hooks off and put a, a long um, J hook on there. Um, uh, I don't think it does much for the action. I, it may change it a little bit, but what it does do is it really ups my um, not necessarily hookup ratio, but keeping a fish pinned. Um, these fish, as you said before, pull drag. They, they're very strong um, fish that, that can make blistering runs on light tackle. Um, I like to have the confidence knowing that if I got a shank in them, that me or my client will land that fish unless it breaks the line. I, I hate worrying about pulling them off at the boat. I don't like gaffing them. Um, so I always try to land them with a landing net um, and treble hooks can cause complications with that. They, they make just like any, I, I guess these are more in the mackerel family, but most tuna like species do a little, a, like a circle of death when you get them under the boat where they just want to swim in a circle and use the, their, their body against the, um, against the current. So um, I use, I use something like this, you know, color can vary. Like I said, I do change my, my colors. This is a very metallic, shiny like one. Um, this is a shore lure, which is more matte finish. It has that little strip down the middle, but the majority of it is a matte finish. And I also have the J hook on there. And so if I'm on your boat and it's time to start jigging, and you're telling me to drop it down. What other instructions do you give, man? Am I going to the bottom? And then so, what's the action on the retrieve? I think you mentioned something about yo-yo instructions, but you know, in general, how do you how do you guide your clients to have the best percentage so chance for, of success? So for Benito, I, I'm rarely dropping it straight down. Um, I find uh, you will get bites like that. Um, uh, sometimes you'll get bites when the jig is fluttering down, um, if you're dropping it straight down. But I think the more productive way to do it um, for me is to set off of the structure. If it's a big enough structure, like um, live bottom, whatever, sit in the middle of the structure and cast out um, to where you think the fish are. So if you're, you've marked them in a certain location, get, you know, casting distance away from there and, and cast away from the boat um, and as far as you can um, and leave your bell open and let that jig sink to the bottom. Sometimes by the, when you flip your bell, you already have them on. They've eaten it on the fall. Um, but most times that's not the case. You'll, you'll, your jig will go down below where those fish are. Um, and then that's when you can do one of two things. And, and the, I think depending on how, um how they're feeding is is you can reel that thing in as fast as you can um and oftentimes when that bait is going from the bottom to the top it it it, it just triggers them like that one's getting away or, or they're not going to be able to eat that one um i think that is a uh, uh, a really important part is that that reaction strike where you're, they're seeing that jig leave the lower column to the upper column and, and it just really triggers that bite. All right. Well, what about now, you know, as we're moving into the podcast, you know, so now I guess you also are always on the eye for bait. And so when we talked about in your show notes, pre-show notes about trolling in the open water around bait, I guess we're talking about bait pods when you're clearly seeing bait. And then what's your approach there? How, how does it change from trolling around structure? Sure. So um, most of the time, uh, this, the time of year and the water temperatures that you're going to have Atlantic Bonito on the water here, um, it's not going to be really visible pods of bait on the surface. Sometimes it is, but most of the time it's going to be smaller 
cloud, what I call cloud bait. So you'll be idling through whatever zone you're looking for and you'll mark a cloud of bait. And sometimes it'll have marks of bonito all around that you can see. And sometimes it won't. Sometimes they'll be way below it where your screen's not picking up those fish because they're sitting below that bait ball. Um, that that's important to remember, man, because a lot of people, or I've, I've had, you know, people that I've, and I'm guilty of it myself where you're trolling or, or you're idling around and you mark some bait and you're like, ah, that's bait, but I don't see any fish or, you know, there's, they show up differently on, on most uh, modern down scan. So, you know, but what's important to remember is you're not seeing through that bait. I mean, most of the time you're, you're not going to be able to see if there's fish under there. Clearly, I mean, you know, definitely you can see sometimes, but if that's really tightly packed bait ball, or, you know, sometimes this time of year when the water's changing, everything's migrating, bait's moving north, um, you'll you'll black out your screen, man, with, with bait. So you can't even really tell what's going on. Is that is that fish? Is that bait? It's hard to tell. Um, it's always worth fishing. You know, it's not, you know, once you're out there trying to – something you've marked is always free. So um, I would definitely encourage anything you mark on your screen. It looks fishy, man. Fish. It. And so are we doing circles around it? Or are we like, I mean, I'm guessing we're never cutting through it. Well, but how you do know, you approach it? So it's not, um, it wouldn't be the same rules as you mentioned cutting through it. If there's visual bait on the surface and fish feeding them, you don't want to cut through it because you'll, you will, interrupt that but most of the time you're not going to be um if you're trolling through it when it's sub water column or or, or mid water column you know you, you're trolling over it with your boat your, your boat's not going to be messing with that bait if it's 20 feet down in the water column so you can i would try to troll right over top of it and and it, depending on the scenario you know you're not going to waste so much time if it's a small cloud of bait um but like I said, in those scenarios where it's blacking out your screen, there's a lot going on. Yeah, spend some time, figure out what's going on. I would I would start out of it and troll through it and troll around it, um, even troll out from it. I mean, you know, most of the time bait's going to mean fish. So um, not all the time, but most of the time, if there's if there's bait fish there, there's going to be something trying to eat it. Um, so yeah, I would spend some time trolling around that whole area if you've marked bait and, and most of the time there's not you know a certain water temperature a certain you know feet of water there's going to be the same scenario so troll down the beach a little bit if you find some bait stick with it and so before we go to what everyone wants to do is casting to fish busting on the surface if i am marking subsurface bait big clouds of bait are you just trolling or, or is this where you would employ your jigging tactic as well? A absolutely. And I think um, more times than not, uh, that jigging tactic on that bait ball is going to be the most effective for the same reason is there's a ball of bait. You know, their, their defense mechanism is in numbers. You know, they, it's confusing. It's hard, to, it's hard for when that fish comes in to bust that bait ball up, it's going to be hard for him to pick out one. That's how they survive. It's just – mass so when this little jig is dropped in that ball of bait under that ball of bait and ripped out of it and it's the one that's getting away it triggers that bite man even if there's just fish not actively feeding on that bait ball that are just following it around waiting for the that bait to rise or waiting for the time to feed um that can absolutely trigger that bite all right so now we'll go to the holy grail now we'll go to cast into bust and fish um I guess just within casting range, are you trying to tread as lightly as possible? What are the, some of the tips of the trade tricks of the trade, you know, when you need them, when it's not just automatic, throw it in there. Sure. So I think, um, anytime there's, there's fish busting on top of the water. Um, I think tread as lightly as possible, man. I mean, I've definitely had times, where, especially with Bonito, um, where it can go on for what seems like an hour. I mean, it's, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of just white water of them feeding constantly on bait. So, and with you constantly hooked up the entire time. So definitely if you can stay off 
stay on the trolling motor, man. That's, that's, that's another thing that I don't see people doing much. And I try to do as much as I can. If there's fish feeding on the top of the water, um, and I can put my trolling motor in the water and keep up with them, which is not always the case, but sometimes you can, um, try to do that, man. I, I think that big motor absolutely messes with you. I, I was talking with a buddy, um, not too long ago, you know, if these fish are in 30 feet of water and you have your big mo motor running, even if it's just in gear slightly or, or idling, I mean, 30 feet, you think of it at 30 feet of water, it seems like pretty deep. You're in the ocean. But if you think about looking up 30 feet, you know, it's, it's not that far, you know, it's, 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 it, the, the thing is sitting right on top of them, especially if they're, if they're feeding on top of the water, that'll definitely interfere. Um, so um most scenarios try to be as, as tread as lightly as possible i i will say um there is times to be aggressive you know if those fish are if you're only seeing them in the distance and you're getting you know five or six cuts on top of the water and they're gone or if you're getting um you know you know 30 or 40 second blitz you know sure run up and, and splash in there because you're only going to get one shot anyway so if I am seeing fish and they are not doing five or six cuts and then, and then dropping, how are you, again, if I'm on your boat, how are you advising me? Am I like throwing past the fish and trying to burn the jig right through the middle of them? Am I casting beyond the fish and pulling it right along the outsides of the fish? Like what, what's the best recipe there as far as directing my cast? Yeah, man. So that's, that's a good question. So, with, with these metal jigs, um, I, I absolutely want you to throw this past them and burn it through there. Um, you can land right in the middle of the blitz if you want to. It's not going to mess them up, and, and sometimes that will uh, result in instantly hooking up. Um, another thing that I like to do um, with, with longer feeding on top, it, it, when your cat, when it seems like it's going on forever, um, and it, you know, they in that case they can be um, a little finicky, as as we all know. One of the things that I do is I'll throw a hard bait, man. Um, I had a lot of success with this last year, and it's really fun. You can't throw them as far, um, but this is a Rapala uh, X wrap. Um, this bait right here with uh, you know the inline hooks was awesome for the Benito last year, and it, what it does is. You don't have to reel it as fast. It, it it stays in that strike zone. This bait suspends, I think, four or five feet underneath the water, um, and they absolutely smoke. It. I mean, it's it's like the perfect size little little hard bait. It, you, like I said, you, you can't. It doesn't work for that five and six fish blitz, or you know, a couple seconds of them up and down where you're having to run around. But for the times when it seems like they're up for a long time and they're not loving the metal jig um which can happen um switching to a hard bait like a rapala or um, a couple other companies make them whether it's a small lip this one doesn't have a lip it's just similar to a, like a mirror lure but it's a bit heavier and you it's you can cast it a little fur further with the with the shape of it but i've caught a pile of bonito the past two years on these and it uh it really it really changes the game for that busting fish action and also um if you think the you know casting these at structure when those fish are higher in the water column but not busting um works as well you if you you can blind cast these well and then um these work for bonito but as well as big spanish mackerel and small king mackerel. all right a couple of uh, i think we've covered the main talking points but i do have a couple of sort of peripheral questions so the first one would be um what mistakes do you see that anglers make between hookup and getting the fish in the boat? Like what's something to make sure you do? What's something to make sure you avoid? Sure. Um, so I think the first mistake after you've hooked one of these fish is uh, a lot of people aren't prepared for how fast they're going to be have, have line peeling off the reel. And the first thing that some people want to do is try to put the brakes on that fish, whether it's tightening the drag or palming the reel, trying to stop that fish from running. And um, you lose them, man, quick that way. And these fish are, are strong. It's 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 their ideal water temperature where they're they're able to really um, really put it down and get away from you. So let them run. Be prepared for that. Have enough braid on your on your casting reel. 
or your um, your spinning reel, whatever you're casting with, um, be prepared to let that fish, you know, run out 50 yards of line. Um, they're gonna do it. Even the small ones, man, they're gonna they're gonna really take off. So, and the and the larger ones can almost spool you, man. So you, you got to be prepared to let that happen, and then work to get that line back. Um, you're not gonna be able to, you know palm the reel and put the brakes on a pelagic fish with light tackle you may be able to do it with you know trolling gear or big boat rod but you're still going to risk the chance of pulling that hook out of that fish's mouth so i would say the biggest mistake i see is having the drag too tight or trying to tighten it or palm the reel when that fish is trying to make its first run all right two more questions i think maybe three set uh one more of the last questions so what is the water temperature that you're waiting for what is it that gets you excited to go out in confidence and search for the first of these fish to arrive 59 60 degrees all right that was a straightforward answer and when yeah. it gets how warm have we realized the bonita probably are gone for the season man um the big mass of them i would say like pushing 70 you know 70 it's and but they were catching them this year until until almost June, I believe. So um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, 72, 73 degree water, you can pretty much ride them all. All right. Next to last question on the jigs. What leader do you like? Like how long of a leader and what pound test or fluoro? And then what knot do you do? What knot do you tie the jig with? Do you tie it just straight on or do you tie like a loop knot to give it more action? Yeah, man. So that's a good question. So, um, if, um, so I use for the Benito, I, I'll use 25 pound floor bottle. Um, you can up that if you want. I, I don't think in most cases when you're moving that bait fast through them, that they're looking at the leader, I guess really heavy leader. Like you don't want to go over 40. There's no need for 40 when you're, when you're fishing through these fish. I mean, they do have teeth. Um, but you know you're you're fine selling with thirty pound floor floor carbon. I mean, um, you can catch you can catch forty pound king mac on on thirty pound floor carbon. So um, use a good good amount of it. I mean, if you tie a good knot from that braid to to the floor, I I tie an Albright knot. You can tie a blood knot, or if you're fancy, you can tie an FG knot. But something that's not going to get caught in your guides when you're making casts. If you are tying something that's a little more bulky, if you're tying a, or if you're tying a swivel but from braid to floor, then you want to have a shorter leader because you want to have enough. You don't want to have too much line out when you're trying to make that cast. Um, and I don't remember the second part of that question, Gary. Help me. Not out. to the jig, loop knot or just straight. Gotcha. Tight. So, so if you see here. Um, this does not have a, a swivel or a um, or a split ring. This is straight to jig. I'll tie a loop knot to that. Um, this jig has a has a um, split ring. You know, it has it, it's already has that little loop that's going to give it action. I'll just tie, you know, a clinch knot to that. Okay. Okay. Now we see it. Then uh, my final question. Will just be anything else about Bonita fishing that I didn't set you up to say. Anything you sort of had in your mind would be good for the podcast, but just didn't come out organically in our Q and A session. Yeah, man. Um, let's think. So for, for with Bonita, the first thing comes to mind is um, etiquette on the water. I think um, I think it's it's a lot of people's first ocean outing of the year. It's a lot of people's, um, you know it's it's exciting everybody wants to do it and i think it's important to remember if you have people sitting on fish busting on the water if you have um if you have people jigging on structure don't troll right on top of them and the same thing if you have people trolling already don't sit in front of them and start jigging um you know it's 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 always good to be respectful of others whether um uh no matter what you're doing, but out, out, it's, it's your first, it's, it's a lot of people's first ocean fishing of the year. And you have, uh, you gotta, I guess, buff out the, the scratches from the year before long winter, not being, 
um, not being out there. And, and it's important to just remember to be polite to everyone, be respectful, have some etiquette when it comes to fishing in general. But fishing for the Benito, I think it draws large crowds to small areas. Um, just be respectful of others, I guess. That's a solid answer. Zane Long, I have enjoyed this conversation. And that is Captain Zane Long of Falling Tide Fishing Adventures out of the Wrightsville Beach area. Man, thank you for making time. Thank you for sharing. Heck yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Good times. Thanks, Zane. Yes, so, sir. Billy, Zane just gave you everything you need to know to catch a bonito, whether you want to troll, cast, or jig. What was your, the Billy's best takeaway? Oh, man. So much stuff, especially in trolling, because I don't know that much about it. So, all that stuff was pretty good takeaway. Uh, but I think, like, I like to jig, especially when this type of fishing, I think it's like the wild dude. I always feel like I'm like a cowboy on the front of a, on a horseback and I'm like chasing after somebody with a, like a, you know what I'm saying? Like a little rope or what? I mean, that's what I feel like. I'm like, yes. I'm in the wild West, dude, this is yes. so fun. And so I think the jigging, the angle like that, you know, I haven't really heard that. No one's really ever told me that like, Hey, kind of focus on the angle and, you know, like mess with it a little bit and, and try to, you know, try to attract the fish that way. So, um, it was always, you know, like, well, and then I suck at, you know, like the approach to casting to a, a group of fish that's blowing up too. I'm like, I was always this guy that will just chuck it wherever I can get right? it. Right? So. I mean, adrenaline's pumping, man. The fish are there. Dude, like, yeah. you can have a plan, but then once those fish present, man, the heart gets beaten. Yeah. It's, you know, sometimes it takes more effort to focus than you have. You just want to sling it, man. Yeah. That's Dude, part of the I, beauty of this. One of my favorite memories ever was on my buddy's boat. It was the first time I ever went, and I didn't know any better. He's like, bring your rod. I'm like, cool. And he didn't tell me what size rod or anything. So I took a little trout rod out there. Dude, I <laughs> got my ass whipped. Dude, it was so much fun. Like, nothing broke. Everything came home, you know, working. But it was like the hardest fishing because I had the wrong equipment. <laughs> so I was like. Dude, I was working, man. And then I like, I like foul hook a couple of them and that's even worse, man. They even go wild. So, um, yeah, yeah. And it's got me excited, like just listening and it is like the freaking wild west out there when you're, and it is etiquette, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone could do a little better and just, you know, pay attention and give people some room and respect. Cause it is fast and furious from what I remember. Anyway, any boat I've it been is. on, it's been nuts. So, and the challenge is, and I, you know, you ask anyone, like most of them will be like, yeah, I'm going to be cool out there. Of course, I'm going to be respectful. But man, if you're out there and you're not catching a fish and you're seeing other people catch a fish, then you start yeah. to crank it up on the aggressive meter. And so suddenly that person who had no doubt he was going to follow etiquette is feeling the pressure, is just, you know, feeling the yearning and then like, says, screw it. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to run up there and get one fish. I mean, so that's the battle. The battle is when you're in the moment to still understand etiquette yeah. and not relent on what you decided, how you decided you were going to conduct yourself before you get out there. You got to stay to that plan because I get it. It's tempting, man. You just get jonesing for a fish. Yeah, man. It's it's fun, man. If anybody's listening or watching and you've never done this, call the captain, book a trip. It's going to be one of the funnest fishing trips you've ever been on. I'm telling you, it is so much fun. It's literally, I'm just like, how in the hell do I get back and do this now? <laughs> like, honey, I got to go back to North Carolina for a couple of days for some business. Big contract. <laughs> yeah, man. And Z Zane will troll, but man, he likes, he, I've fished with him, man. He likes to be interactive. He likes you to be busy on the boat. He likes you to work on the boat and not just wait for the troll. Sometimes troll is the way to go, at least yeah. to set up the day. But man, he is always looking for the more interactive approach to catching fish, putting fish in the boat. Fun to fish with. Yeah, man. Sounds good, Gary. Well, you got my blood boiling. So uh, I'm excited to get back to North Carolina and, and do some of the style fishing. So, uh, and thanks again to Marine Warehouse Center. If you need a boat, if you're over here like, man, I want to go, I want to go, but I don't have a boat, get a Marine Warehouse Center, <laughs> get them a boat. If you can't afford it, go to Bland Landscaping <laughs> and get a new job. <laughs> marine warehouse center has boats on site now like there is just no inventory oh, cool. last year this year yeah. it's not like a surplus it's not like we're back to normal but there are boats on premise and so you can go and check out boats of course they'll order what you need if it's not there on the on the yard and again as we keep stressing you know 
service and product sales, man, they have it all. They're 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 there for you. And then yeah, man, bland landscaping, man. I, you know, just say like those guys because they like us. But man, I just like their style. And again, happy to have them associated with the podcast. Hope we're doing a good job of getting the word out that they are a company that you want to align with. You know, look at them for your career choice. Yeah. Absolutely, man. We appreciate our appreciate our sponsors. If you want to become a sponsor, reach out to me, Billy at fishermanspost.com, and we can get some more information to you and see if we're a good fit for each other. Until next time, Gary, I'll see you in the next episode. Fisherman's Post.